Now, on HistoryRadio.org, Professor John Merriman lectures on trench warfare during the First World War. The recording is part of Yale University's Open Courses, and was published online under a Creative Commons license. The audio has been edited for time. We are the guns, and your masters. Saw ye our flashes? Heard ye the scream of our shells in the night, and the shuddering crashes? Over the fields and the flats, and the reeds of the barrier water, to wait on the hour of our choosing, the minute decided for slaughter? Gilbert Franca. Officers weren't all fancy generals who were sitting drinking champagne, plotting the deaths of all these people. The junior officers, they're the ones that blew the whistles and said, follow me, men, and they'd jump over armed with only a pistol. They're toast. July 1st, 1916, just the first day of the Battle of the Somme, 20,000 British soldiers were killed, not just killed and wounded, dead, in one day. The invasion of Belgium brought uh, Britain into the war, and the Germans were counting on the fact that it would take Britain a very, very long time to raise an army, not a navy, but an army of any size, and what they called the British Expeditionary Force does arrive and takes its place uh, next to the French, but it's very small because, they, unlike the French, they did not have military conscription until uh, late in the war. Uh, Germany, as France, as everybody was worried about the home front, hurt their chances of pulling this off by moving some divisions to Alsace to try to blunt the force there. And also some more uh, are headed off to uh, the Eastern Front because they start to realize that the Russians are mobilizing uh, more rapidly than they thought they could. It's possible to argue that the Battle of the Marne saves Paris and saves France. And Schlieffen would have gone crazy about this. The last thing he said that supposedly in his life was let the last soldier touch the English Channel and then come down and hit Paris. But they turned down before that, and the first planes were reconnaissance planes, and at one point in uh, this, this huge engagement featuring just enormous, enormous armies, in the German case supplied by trains going uh, so, you know, many every hour across the Rhine, the French planes see that there's a big gap in the German lines, and so they counterattack. And you could hear the battle in Paris. You could hear the, the roll of thunder of the guns. When you ask how the, the French home front holds together so long, it's that the Germans are so close. And in 1918, they'll be close again. And in 1918, they're firing this huge gun, which the British soldiers called Big Bertha. And it's lobbing from way, way the hell up in the north. It's lobbing shells from the, behind the German lines all the way to Paris on Easter Sunday, 1918, hit an apartment house on uh, the Church of Saint-Gervais, an apartment house on the Boulevard uh, Port-Royal, uh, run on the Rue de Rivoli. Not, and so they're, they're, the Germans are so close. But in 1914, what happens is, is that the commander of Paris, Gallieni, uh, he commandeers the Paris taxis. And they're literally carrying soldiers out to the front at the Battle of the Marne. The Battle of the Marne stops the German advance. And then the race to the sea begins. And they try to outflank each other. Both sides are trying to turn the corner. You know, they end up at the sea. And uh, at that point, the trenches are dug literally from the sea all the way to, to Switzerland. Only a couple people who had seen the, uh, what was going on in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905 uh, could have imagined that this war in which the offense was supposed to have every advantage. Remember, uh, the French commander said, "Elan vital, we need this the frenetic uh, patriotic energy. That's all we need. We need to attack and keep on attacking. It doesn't work out that way. And the reason that you have all of these millions of people killed, the flower of British youth, the flower of every youth in that period, is because this offensive war becomes a defensive struggle in which breaking through is almost literally impossible. 
Most people are killed by shells in World War I than dying in any other way. And they're new and horrible ways of dying. Flamethrowers, for example. Poison gas, which is first used by the Germans at Ypres, one of the many battles of Ypres. There's 12 battles of the same river in northern Italy. There are several battles of the Somme. I mean, these battles keep on happening because large chunks of real estate are virtually impossible to conquer. And so trenches are defensive uh, weapons. And one of the reasons that the breakthrough is impossible is that when you, you know, you're going to try to break through these trenches, uh, what they have is what they call creeping barrages. You know, they start trying to, and lots of people died, they try to coordinate the shelling so to go in advance of the people going over the top and then trying to carry 60 pounds, pick up 60 pounds sometimes, worth of stuff on your back and to down into these horrible crater of craters full of all sorts of crap and dead floating rats and dead floating bodies of human beings and to try to get to break through and then you run into machine guns. And the machine guns, which can fire what, is it 600 rounds a minute? And the Gatling guns had first been used, in, I think, in the American Civil War, but these are much more rapid firing. And they, just, they aim basically at your knees, and they just sort of go back and forth, back and forth. And then barbed wire. One of the things that soldiers had to carry with them were wire cutters, and sometimes the wire cutters weren't equal to the task of cutting the wire. It's hard to cut, cut wire if you know, people are firing machine guns at you as well. And so that's why the trenches are you know, fairly elaborate uh, defensive uh, weapons, and everybody has seen the footage of real battle. I mean, sometimes they've wrecked it. And they used to have this amazing small uh, clip of, you see these three guys, and they're about ready to go, and the guy, one guy blows his whistle, say, follow me, and the first guy goes up, and he, he gets his head over, then he's kind of, he's dead, he falls back, and the second guy goes up, and he gets a little further, then you see his body hit. And then the third guy, and you don't know what happens to him, but his chances weren't very good. So breaking through, I mean, it's, it's, there are debates on, on how ridiculous the, uh, these people like uh, Nivelle were or uh, Foch and Joffre and, and the whole gang because they keep ordering these attacks. The breakthrough is going to come next. We've really got them. We're going to break through. But they don't break through or they can't break through. And that is background for the mutinies. And the first real breakthrough doesn't come until March 1918 in the Ludendorff Offensive. And then they run overrun their, their supplies and it kind of snaps back like a rubber band and pushes them back. And the Germans at that point know that they're not going to win the war. When the war ends, the war ends with German troops far inside France. So how do you explain that back to the home front? And uh, the Berlin home front has started to collapse. There's great uh, deprivation, great uh, problems getting enough to eat in that situation, and that will make it easier later for Hitler and many other little would-be Hitlers to argue that you were winning, but you were stabbed in the back by the Jews and the communists and the socialists and the peaceniks and all of these people uh, from, from their point of view. And so uh, when you do these creeping barrages, you know, you're indicating where the attack's going to come. And behind the trenches, the Germans, uh, as do the French, have railroad lines that are used to bring in reinforcements to bring in supplies. And so we, what you do is you bring in supplies, you bring in reinforcements. Breaking through uh, is very, very difficult. Uh, it, it's almost impossible. And that's why you have uh, the carnage. There are more British soldiers killed or seriously wounded in the first three days of the Battle of the Somme than there were Americans killed in World War I, Korea, and Vietnam. In three days. The first three days. Somebody said, you discuss your own death as if you were discussing a lunch that you were planning tomorrow. And someone else said, I didn't want to die at least until I'd finished reading The Return of the Native. And so that again is background for uh, the mutinies. And what is amazing is that the armies hold together really until 1917 and even beyond the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And the Russian case too is remarkable, the Battle of Tannenberg. It's just you know, an amazing battle in 1914, and the, there's so many casualties, they couldn't even count them, there's so many people dead. And there'd never been a war like this. No one had ever seen, couldn't have imagined a war like this. So, I mean, the English had the advantage of having the channel there. That you go to the officers' club at Victoria Station, have a decent lunch, knock down a couple pints of beer, and you're on the front in the early evening and can be dead by early evening. With these Welsh miners, uh, in Belgium, they tunnel under this, this sort of promontory that's sticking up, that's a defensive position for the Germans, and they bring in all these munitions and they blow the thing up. They blow this huge thing up. In Kent, supposedly, it is said that people in Kent 
uh, on and near the coast of the English Channel could actually hear the explosion. So the war is that close. And of course, it's close in other ways. Imagine that you lived in a village in France or anywhere, and the facteur, the, in our case, the factrice, the, the mail carrier comes. It's you don't want the mail carrier to come to your house. You don't want mail, because he uh, would be carrying a, a telegram saying, be proud of X, who has just died for you fill in the country, Turkey, Bulgaria, Romania, France, Germany, Russia, Britain, anywhere. It became a war like no other war, and uh, with the only possible exception is the Spanish Civil War, has given birth to really the greatest writing about, about arguably any war, certainly in history, and, and arguably any events outside of maybe the rise of Hitler in National Socialism. And they're still arguing over these battles. Passchendaele was one of these places that they first used poison gas. And uh, uh, you know, now there's, it's in, in Belgium, a, a lot of housing development. And you, you can't even see the hell that was Passchendaele was actually there. If you're going to go see these battlefields, the, the one to go to is Verdun, because that, that, there you can go through these forts, Douaumont and Vaux. And uh, you can imagine what it's like. And you can see some places where they've left uh, they, in the winds and the mists and the terrible weather of that part of France and the one road going from Bar-le-Duc supplying, uh, on the, on the sacri- sacred road supplying Verdun, uh, you still see there's one place where they've left the, you know, the guns with their bayonets and there's a lot of hand-to-hand fighting there and, and that's the place where Falkland Heights said we can afford to lose more children, uh, more young people, more young men, we will simply outbleed them. And he hurdles one attack after another over most of 1916 against Verdun. And that's where so many people uh, die. And of course, that is the background also for these mutinies. The Western Front, 1915-1917, it really doesn't uh, move at all. If you go up, uh, well, any of them, if, if you go to the Marne, which is where the Somme basically was, uh, or in the Pas de Calais, there are just fields and fields, these cemeteries, of uh, hundreds of thousands of crosses. The war became the dominant experience uh, in the lives of Europeans, period, no matter how old you were, uh, because you knew somebody who died. You had a relative who died. There are in France, where much of the fighting was, the Western Front fighting, 36,000 communes, which is an administrative unit. 36,000. 12 out of 36,000 had nobody killed in World War I. If people were skilled workers who could work in munitions factories, could get out. And there are a lot of tensions between rural and urban people because there was a, urban people who had rationing problems said, oh, you know, the rural people are, are hoarding their, their products. But there are places you can go where you, there's one town, there, 74 people died, very small town in the south of France, in a place called Aviron. You know, there's hardly 74 houses. And there's a village way up in the Savannah Mountains. The, the monument to the dead is inside the church. And when you show people this beautiful uh, Renaissance entryway, Porte, and there's 12 people killed in the war, and there aren't 12 houses. We know more about the Western Front, but it's the same thing in every country that you're talking about. The numbers of people killed around will make clear what the countries were that really suffered the most, and they were Germany and, and France, and then followed by, by Russia, but also Britain. And don't forget in Britain, you know, remember I said that, that the four empires disappear. Well, the fifth empire arguably disappears in the end because of, of, of dynamics caused by the war. People in the so-called colonies, the fighting for the British Empire, uh, they began to think, well, why shouldn't we have independence? Why shouldn't we have freedom too? And of course, at the Battle of Gallipoli, which is one of the you know, great tragedies of, of the war, when Churchill, who had 10 ideas a, a day and nine of them were bad, as one of his critics said, Churchill said, you know, we'll take the pressure off uh, by, we'll, uh, we'll t- knock the Turks out of the war. And so they're going to have this impossible assault on Turkish fortified positions. And so they said, well, we'll knock them out of the war with the Australians and the Indians and, and the New Zealanders. And, uh, you know, we can afford to lose them more easily. Of course, that still resonates in places like New Zealand and Australia and in India as well. When I used to work at uh, Vincennes in the military archives there, I was reading day by day, you know, the correspondence from various regions in France, and, and I was trying to find uh, documents. This was when I was just starting out. 
And I knew the stuff was there, and so I bribed one of the guards to uh, let me back in the stacks where you're not supposed to go in French archives. But I remember what I saw was this huge number of thing of boxes. This is in the mid-70s. It's big security. And I said, well, you know, what's all that? And he said, well, those are the mutiny documents. Those are the documents from the mutinies in 1917. Now, finally, a guy was able to get in, because in France there's a 50-year rule, and he should be able to consult documents. And this guy was finally able to get exception to go work on these documents. And so the thesis that was published is very good by a guy called Guy Pedrocini, and it's on the mutinies. So now we know about the mutinies. So what do we know about the mutinies? Uh, several things is that the mutinies were spread rapidly. They did indeed begin with soldiers who were being sent to the front buying like sheep as if they were being sent to a slaughterhouse because that's what they were being sent to. What's the difference between a soldier carrying 60 pounds of equipment going to some attack that's going to go nowhere, whereas chances of being killed are enormous, and sheep being led to a slaughterhouse? What is the difference? Really not much. And when the mutiny started, there were only really four reliable divisions they figured at one point between Paris and the German lines. The incredible thing was, is because soldiers never talk about the battle when they went go back. They don't talk about the battle. It was impossible to communicate what was going on. And the mutinies were one of the well-kept secrets. Nobody knew. The Germans didn't know at the time. Hardly anybody knew. But the, the mutinies involved thousands and thousands and thousands of soldiers. In some cases, they elected people to represent them. In a few cases where the officers maintained the upper hand, they simply similarly shot mutineers. So they were massive, but they had nothing to do with socialist or anarchist or pacifist propaganda at all. There were congresses, there was a congress in Sweden, there was another one in, in Switzerland. The, uh, the French government would not let representatives go to those congresses. And the first reaction, the high command, was that the socialists, now they're showing their true uh, stripes, uh, anarchist propaganda is working. The Bolshevik Revolution had not yet happened, that was in October, but the, the Russian Revolution in February had already occurred. It has nothing to do with it. What they objected to, uh, they were not defeatist at all. They did not want the Germans to win the war. But they realized that they weren't going to win the war either, and that this strategy was completely futile. There were cases of fraternization. They're very famous cases. Christmas, 1914, on the front, way up near Belgium, on the British side particularly. They start yelling back and forth, the Germans and the British, and they, they say basically, screw this stuff. Why don't we take the day off? And so the Welsh were singing Christmas carols to the Germans, and the Germans were getting their best singers and, and uh, singing back. They actually did get together and play a soccer game. They found a place that wasn't totally chopped up and played. In 1915, on Christmas, a British soldier said, why don't we do the same thing? And they put them up against the wall and shot him. But still, you hear all these stories. These two German guy and a, and a British guy find themselves in a crater, both on the verge of death and they're discussing Nietzsche until somebody finally comes and rescues them. I mean, a lot of this may be apocryphal, but the mutinies had to do not with defeatism, it had to do with the sheer madness of it all. Still historians who are saying, well, you know, the creeping barrages, if they hadn't made them, they'd made them a little bit more organized, and maybe the breakthroughs would have come, and they're still defending the impossible after all of these years. Verdun was 1916. It begins in February. It rains all the time in that part of France. To explain the mutinies is also to understand Verdun. The whole bloody mess. They died in hell. They called it Passchendaele. That was a place where the British gained four miles. That's about uh, seven kilometers in exchange for 300,000 dead or wounded. Take, uh, Take a football stadium like University of Michigan or UT Austin and fill it up three times and imagine that you know those people. That's what it was like. 1917. 1917 changes everything because two key events happen, and they're obvious. One is the Russian Revolution in 1917 in February, and then the Russian Revolution in October. But it's clear that when the Bolsheviks seize power in October 1917 that the Russians are, are going to get out of the war and that peace, land, and bread is a powerful, powerful slogan for the Russian soldiers. And it's amazing that the Russian soldiers didn't all 
go back to uh, Vladivostok or to Kazakhstan or to wherever, uh, that they were able to hold on as long as they did. And so that's going to change things. It's at that time that um, the second event happens, and that's the Americans come into the war. Outside of places like Chicago and Milwaukee and Philadelphia, maybe, they had lots of Germans. Most people in the United States want the Allies to win. The Americans were angered by the submarine warfare campaign. In 1915, a boat called the Lusitania was sunk. There had been warnings posted by the German government saying, if you're a passenger, don't go on that, you're going to go in a war zone. The Germans claimed when the boat was sunk that it was full of munitions. The Americans and the British said, no, it wasn't. In fact, it was. That was proved about 20 years ago by divers. The Lusitania was sunk near Ireland, and lots of people died. And the Germans know that the only way they can win the war is the unrestricted campaign of submarine warfare to try to keep Britain from being supplied by American supplies. And Wilson, who won election, on the, uh, he kept us out of war, he takes the country into war, and eventually he can't get the Treaty of Versailles passed even by the American uh, isolationist uh, Senate. So the Americans go to war in 1917. But now it wasn't the American troops that made the difference. In the imaginary, the imaginaire, in the, in the perceptions of the French, it was the arrival of, uh, of General Pershing, you know, who had made his career sort of uh, slaughtering Mexicans in Mexico. You know, the image was that the far west was coming and, and these sort of gun-toting uh, Dodge City types were, were going to turn the tide. That's not what happens. But what turns the tide is that once the Americans are in the war, that the tremendous industrial strength of the U.S. means the curves are going to cross. The Germans know they ain't going to win the war. And the, the British and the French and the, the American high command, they know they're going to win the war. And they think they're going to win the war in 1920 or 1921. Maybe 1919 if all goes well. There was a quote in there after they just had, at the cost of thousands of uh, lives, they had got a, a couple kilometers of territory back from the Germans. And somebody says, you know, at this rate, we'll get to the Rhine in the year 2006, I think is what they, what they figured being in until the end was going to be a long time if we were able to survive. So those are the two big events, the curves cross. 1917 is also an important year because tanks begin to make a difference. Tanks can't do anything in, the, in these craters. They get stuck. They're, what are those things? They're treads, you know, just sort of spin like a car stuck in the snow in North Haven or something. They don't make any difference until, uh, until they actually they can break into the open. And at that point, then they can be a way of protecting infantry uh, behind them. Uh, but so 1917 really turns it around. In 1918, Hindenburg and Ludendorff have taken over the government. The uh, Second Reich is now controlled by the military. So Ludendorff said, look, you know, we've got to do it now. If we don't do it now, it ain't never going to happen. And so they throw every conceivable resource into this uh, offensive. And they do break through. They do break through. And you can look at the map. They get a long way. But then it snaps back like a rubber band. They overrun their supplies, as they had in 1914. They get tired, and then they're pushed back. And at that point, the worst days of the bombardment of Paris has ended. The Allies are sure they're going to win the war, and that uh, the Germans and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which is uh, are almost on the verge of collapse, uh, despite the sheer inefficiency of the Italian uh, military, they know that it's going to collapse, and that Russia's coming out of the war in the long run did not make that much of a difference because the Italians are able to, to stabilize really the front in, in, in Austria-Hungary and, and the whole thing is, is going to collapse and the Austria-Hungarian Empire, the nationalities are putting forward their claims and Franz Josef dies in 1916 and it's not going to go that long. And finally on the 11th of, uh, of November 1918 in a railroad car north of Paris and near Compiègne and the, they uh, sign on the dotted line and the armistice is declared. France in victory is not as strong as Germany in defeat, because Germany is industrially a much more prosperous country. And, and this will hang over the negotiations at Versailles, because the French demand that somebody pay for the war, of which France suffered more than any other country in terms of its agricultural land being ch The highest percentage of uh, losses was France, with 16.8% of those mobilized killed in Germany, 15.4% killed. But if you take those in combat, it's 22% officers and 18% uh, soldiers. Anyway, Serbia loses 37% of all its combat. 
they don't have as many, Turkey 27 percent, Romania 25 percent, and Bulgaria 22 percent. The war starts uh, in early August 1914 and ends on the 11th of, of November 1918. Every day of those years, think four years back in your own lives, 900 Frenchmen were killed every day. That's a lot of telegrams, be proud of X. 1,300 Germans were killed every day. So they were there to go over the top, and they're dead at the end. Unlike previous wars, disease didn't play a major part, unlike, for example, the Crimean War. Though the blue flu, sometimes called the Spanish flu, as you know, will kill more people in 1918, 1919, 1920 than the war. Most people die of shells, followed by machine guns and flames. Shell shock were first identified at this time, after the war. Freud was very interested in that, among other people. And you saw people be begging with one arm, or one leg, or no legs. You saw people who had also choked out their lungs on gas, or who were blind. They were all over the place. And Europe was a country of widows, especially in countries like Italy, where widows still wore black all the time. If you had a demographic curve, a triangle, it was like a shark it had eaten a huge bite out of the male population between 18 and, say, 55. The Battle of the Somme lasted five months. Gallipoli lasted more than eight months. Verdun, ten months. Ypres in 1917, four months. Four million men participated in the Battle of the Somme. Four million. More than a quarter were killed, captured, or classified as disappeared. Battlefields were no longer called the field of glory. Also, there's a brutalization because you were dealing with so many people dead all around, you were fighting for your life, you, the, the attitude that people had toward other people changes, and the demons of the 20th century, fascism, above all, would be built on that dehumanization. Difficult to imagine, though not impossible, the Holocaust without World War I. But given the Turks and, the, and what they did to the Armenians, it's hard to say. Uh, most of the atrocities were committed by the Germans in Belgium. Uh, they gunned down, they executed 5,500 Belgian civilians. Edith Cavell was the most famous, the nurse, in part because German soldiers believed that they were being picked off by civilians, is what had happened in France in 1870 to 71. But the Russians committed atrocities in East Prussia and in Galicia. The Austrians, who had been told that the Serbs were, were subhuman, committed atrocities there. There were rapes, not yet rape had not become an arm of, of, of combat, as it would with the Russians after World War II, but people were treated like uh, animals. So I want to end with a haunting film done by Abel Gans. It's called J'accuse, I accuse. It's not the same thing as Zola's I accuse, but it's another one. Made in 1918 to 1919. The hero, Jean Diaz is a wounded soldier poet. He begins to lose his mind. He escapes from the hospital and he reaches his village. There he summons the villagers and he tells them of a dream. It starts in a battlefield graveyard with wooden crosses all here and there and everywhere. A huge black cloud rises above it and magically ghost-like figures emerge from the ground. They're wrapped in tattered bandages, some limping, some blind walking with upraised arms, stumbling blindly like Frankenstein's monster. They leave the battlefield and they go home. They go from the graves to their villages. And they want to see if their sacrifices have been in vain. And they get back to their villages and what they find is that their wives have cheated on them. They find that the people are still ripping people off by false weights at the market. The petty ways have continued despite the horrific losses. And they say, you must mend your ways. We didn't go through all of this hell so you would continue to behave like you do. The world, after all, must be a better place. Isn't it a better place now? Won't it be? That's the big illusion, by the way, about 1920s and 1930s, because the world wasn't going to be a better place. And they, they believe their mission is fulfilled, and they go back uh, to their graves. After recounting this dream, the poet, now totally mad, accuses the sun above of standing idly by and watching the war go on. And then he dies. Now, the, one of the oddest things about this, about how art and reality merge, is that this film was made before the end of the war. And Abel Gans, the producer, got permission from the army to have real soldiers 
be extras in his movie. And you can see real people who are not going back to the front with their arms ripped off. Stumps. They had stumps. And some of the people who were in that movie went back to the front and were killed. And they didn't survive the war. The war had taken a terrible vengeance, you know, both in art, joys of, of, of great artistic production, but on reality too. It's, it's an incredible scene. And of course, things couldn't be back again. You couldn't go back to your village. You couldn't get, get off a bus and fall into the, the arms of your family. One way of looking at the entire period, 1914, to 1945 is to view it as an entire, more horrible 30 years war. Because things don't get better, they get worse, if that's even possible. Hitler said in 1939, after all, who will remember the Armenians? We are the guns and your masters. Saw ye our flashes? Heard ye the scream of our shells in the night and the shuddering crashes? Over the fields and the flats and the reeds of the barrier water to wait on the hour of our choosing, the minute decided for slaughter, Gilbert Franca. You have just heard Professor John Merriman lecturing on trench warfare during the First World War. The recording is part of Yale University's Open Courses, and was published online under a Creative Commons license. The audio was edited for time. We willed it not. Wake up, England! Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. This is HistoryRadio.org, a free educational radio stream, remembering the First World War.